All right, let's review parts one, two, and three. Here's the first question. What do articles four, five, six, and seven address? Number four, what is it? Remember four corners, four states. There you go, states, okay? Number five, remember the V? Goes over, amendments, very good. Number six, take the V and the I, switch it over, I am supreme, okay, supremacy. And number seven, the crazy weird one where it kind of looks like an ATI, <laughs> ratification, right. Excellent. Next question. Name the constitutional references for the following three clauses, okay? This should be something that's already ingrained. Here we go. Interstate Commerce Clause, remember? Article, yep, ICC 183, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. Good. Next one. Necessary and Proper Clause. Remember, 1 and 8 are necessary. Yeah, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18. And General Welfare Clause, 181st Airborne, right? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. Excelente. Okay. Next one. Explain the significance of the highlighted portion of the Supremacy Clause. This is a question we've had on every single one so far. You can tell I'm a little bit obsessed with it, but it's an important one. Okay. Which shall be made in pursuance thereof? Why does that matter? Why does it matter? Excellent. Okay. Here's my, my idea, and your idea flows of this, I'm sure. Just because law is a federal law, that does not mean it is supreme and wins out in a conflict between federal and state law. What wins out is the Constitution. So if a federal law is made that violates the Constitution instead of follows it, then the law is not the supreme law of the land. The Supremacy Clause puts the Constitution as the supreme law of the land, not federal law as the supreme law of the land. Right? Okay. Excellent. Let's move on to the General Welfare. The general Welfare Clause is based on the following idea. Okay, fill in the blank. If it's not blank, you blank. Do it. If it's not listed, you can't do it. Right? That's the basic idea there for the uh, general welfare clause. Next question is: General welfare powers are listed in which article, section, and clauses? Now, this is a hard question. Which article, section, clauses are the general welfare? Remember, Article One, Section Eight, clauses two through nine and seventeen. Good. That was tough. Now, follow-up, should be able to fill in the blank here, um, the, the gap, common defense powers, where are they located? What article, section, clause are they? they are article 1, section 8, clauses 10 through 16. Good. Okay, now the next question, fill in the blank, the 10th Amendment. This is a very, very important amendment. I, I would challenge you to memorize this. This is a good one, really good one. The blank, not delegated to the United States, are reserved to the blank, respectively, or to the blank. What's the first one? The powers not delegated to the United States, good, are reserved to the blank respectively, to the what? To the states or to the who? To the people. Good. So the powers not delegated to the United States are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So notice it's a two-part question. Um, it's fill in the blank, which we just did, but what about an explanation? What do you think? Well, why does the 10th Amendment matter? What is it saying? Got it? Okay. Here's an idea. Here, here's like, once again, this isn't word for the right answer, but it's an idea that's the right answer. If a power isn't specifically given to the United States, then that power can only be used by the states or by the people themselves. Okay? It's not listed. You can't do it, that type of thing. All right, so let's see if you remember the general welfare clause. Word for word. You ready? Let's fill in the blanks here. The Congress shall have power to provide for the common defense and general welfare. Good job. Okay, remind me, necessary and proper clause. What are the, what's the reference there? Remember? One and eight are necessary, yeah, okay. Article one, section eight, clause 18. Excellent, okay. So we're gonna start, we always start with this example, this analogy of the car and mechanic shop. Remember, people and states are represented by the car owner and the federal government is represented by the mechanic shop, okay? Use the same idea. All right, just like last time, you, you set up a contract. You know how important that contract is. And you say, look, none of this funny business. I don't want you to change my car in a Ferrari. Pretty simple here, right? Here, let's look at the contract. Let's read it together. Here's what it says. Change out the brake pads on the front wheels, right? Simple stuff. That's what I want you to do. Yep, okay. So you write, sign the contract. You take your copy. He takes his copy. And uh, I don't know, you're a little bit curious. You're not totally trusting this mechanic shop. So you stick around and watch through the bay windows and watch what they're doing. Kind of, you have your nose pressed to the glass, okay? And you're watching them out there. 
And sure enough, right there in front of you, they start taking the wheel off of your car. Like, well, no, wait a second. You whip out your contract and say, look, right here at the top, just like we talked about last time, I authorize you to do these things. I only authorize you to change out my brake pads. And he says, well, how about we go to the bottom this time? Let's look at the bottom. And the bottom says this. I authorize the mechanic shop to do those things which are necessary and proper. Sir, if I'm going to change out your brake pads, I've got to take your wheel out. It's necessary. It's proper that I do that in order to get to your to change out your brakes. And so you kind of put your tail sheepishly between your legs and walk out like, oh, okay, that makes sense. You're right. So that part at the bottom of the contract, that's similar to the necessary and proper clause. Okay, so let's read through that together. I authorize the mechanic shop to do those things which are necessary and proper. Okay, it's similar to the necessary and proper clause. It says, the Congress shall have power to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper. Now remember, the Congress is represented by mechanic shop, right? Federal government by the, by the mechanic shop. Mechanic shop shall have power to make all laws. Let's change that to do those things that shall be necessary and proper. Just like Congress shall have power to, do, to make laws that shall be necessary and proper. Okay? Let's take that, that little clause and throw it down at the bottom of our contract and, and insert it there. You see how the necessary and proper clause is similar to that, to that phrase of the contract, how it works together? All right, so we've got through that analogy. We're looking at the real words. Let's pull out our constitutions, okay? Pull out your copy of the constitution. Get, get yourself a pink highlighter. How's that? Get yourself a pink highlighter, and we're going to highlight the necessary and proper clause, okay? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, yep. Now let's look at the example here that we have. I'm going to show you what we're going to highlight. Find Clause 18. It's just the first few words there. To make all laws that shall be necessary and proper. Highlight that. Okay, make your constitution look like this example here. Highlight that in pink. And like usual, we're going to take those words that are small in the copy and we're going to stick them here in the, in the uh, slide so we can look at them and analyze them together. All right? So very clearly, here's what it says, right? Congress shall have power to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper. You can see how people get confused about that because well, who's going to decide what's necessary and proper? Let's go back to our car shop analogy. Let's say you go back and sit down, you're know, eating your popcorn there, waiting for them to get your car done. You look out the window and you see the guy pulling out a grinder and cutting a rectangle on the top of the, the roof of your car. Whoa, that really is across the line, right? So then you do run out there, like, what are you doing? And he says, well, right here, it says I have to do those things which, like, I'm authorized to do those things which are necessary and proper. And you say, well, well necessary and proper, what are you talking about? That's not necessary and proper. He's like, well, no, it's necessary and proper for your happiness. You like sunroofs, don't you? Yeah, I like sunroofs, but I didn't ask you to do that. Well, I think it's necessary and proper. Okay, so now you come to a head again here, right? You have to decide, well, who decides what's necessary and proper? Is it the mechanic shop or is it you, the car owner? Very clearly, it's you, the car owner, isn't it? Now, the important part, let's pull out this contract again, and you look at it, it starts by saying, I authorize the mechanic shop to do those things which are necessary and proper. But you recognize that there's an important part that's left out there. The important part that's left out that needs to be in there is the, are the words, in order to make the repairs listed above. Because otherwise, the only thing that binds them is what's necessary and proper, and that might be an opinion. It might be subjective. He might say a sunroof is necessary for your happiness. But you might say, it is not necessary for my happiness, and I'm the one who gets to decide that, right? So it's important, those, those words at the end there, that's the exact same thing with the necessary and proper clause in the Constitution. So many times people read it and say, Congress shall have power to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper. And I think this is necessary and proper. But what they fail to do is read the next seven words, which are so critical, which make the clause what it is. Here's the next seven words. And they very clearly say, for carrying into execution, the foregoing powers. Just like we talked about way back in the Supremacy Clause, this is a condition, okay? They do, Congress is empowered to make laws, but only those that are necessary and proper in order to carry out the foregoing powers. Okay, so that, that gives the meaning to the, to the clause, that for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Okay, take out your Constitution, it should be out already, Underline that. Underline it in red. For carrying in execution the foregoing powers. Got it? Okay, now let's, let's focus on two words in that small phrase. Foregoing powers. What does that mean? Circle those for me. Foregoing powers. What's foregoing mean? Doesn't it mean those that come before? Those that were just listed, right? <laughs> Some of this is starting to kind of sound redundant. Yeah, exactly. The necessary and proper cause supports what we've already talked about. Just to be crystal clear for your notes, I want you to take in the margin there and write just listed. Right next to it, it says foregoing powers, write just listed. And what are those just listed powers? What are they? They're the ones that are in clauses two 
through 9 and clauses 10 through 16, right? So draw little arrows if you want to, like I've done here. And that shows those, these are the foregoing powers. The only power that Congress has to make laws that are necessary and proper is to carry into execution those laws that are just listed, that are foregoing powers, to help those be executed. Okay, so now we're going to look at Article 1, Section 8 in a visual way. It's kind of a fun way. To me, it, it wraps things up somewhat, okay? So what you have is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 on the top. That's your general welfare clause, right? And that's your top, right? Now remember, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, the last clause in the section is your bottom. That's your necessary and proper clause. And everything in between is the stuff that the general welfare clause refers to and that the necessary and proper clause refers to, okay? It's kind of like a sandwich. So here's, a, here's the visual. Are you ready? You got the top piece of bread is the general welfare clause. The bottom piece of bread is the necessary and proper clause. And all the stuff in the middle are the listed delegated powers that the general welfare, pow general welfare clause refers to and that the necessary and proper clause refers to. Okay? It's kind of a tight, nifty little sandwich there. General welfare, necessary and proper, and all the meat in between. Cool? All right. Works for me. Hopefully it works for you. So let me give you an example, all right, of a law that's necessary and proper in order to carry into execution one of those foregoing powers. Let's choose Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. What is that? To coin money, right? There it is. It's listed. Okay, so we're on right track. It's listed here. Now, in order to coin money, I don't know if you've ever seen coining of money. I haven't seen it myself. I've looked at it on the internet. But it's just a matter of taking metal and sticking it into a mold and then cutting it and molding it and boom, next thing you know, you coin a piece of money. Okay? Does Congress have the legitimate power to do that? You bet they do. It says it right there. They have the ability to coin money. But does Congress have the ability to build a mint? Do they have the power, the authority to build a mint in order to coin that money? Does it say there anywhere in that list of powers that, that they can build a mint? No. The real question though, is it necessary in order to coin money to build a mint? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, so building the U.S. mint, it's necessary and proper in order to uh, coin money in order to do that thing that they, they've been authorized to do. Now, is that a direct listed power? No, it's not. The, ability, the, the power to build a mint is not a direct listed power. It's what is often called an implied power or an indirect power, okay? And this clause is sometimes referred to as elastic clause. Because what's an elastic? It's, it's a rubber band, right? It can be stretched. Stretched to do those things that it doesn't really exactly say in the Constitution, but that it infers and implies that need to be done. In order to coin money, you have to build them in. And so they can do that even though it's not listed. Does that make sense? That's the idea of necessary and proper. It is necessary and proper, so therefore they can build them in in order to do the listed uh, duty of coining money. So it's, uh, the necessary and proper clause is often called the elastic clause. I don't prefer to call it that, though, because when you start to use those words, you go, oh, well, let's stretch it. Oh, yeah, we can stretch it because the elastic clause. Well, like it's a little scary because they, people tend to use that word, that term, just like use a necessary and proper clause, and you leave out the true meaning of it. It kind of opens, opens the door for all kinds of mischief, doing whatever you want to do. So the bottom line is, are there powers that Congress can do that aren't listed in the Constitution? The answer is yes, but those are clearly conditioned on being necessary and proper to carry into execution a, a truly listed power. Quick question for you. Can the necessary and proper clause get abused? You bet. Let's look at an example, okay? Here it is. When people get older, it's necessary that they have money set aside for retirement, and it's proper for them to have insurance to pay for their health problems. Is that a true statement? You better believe it. Insurance, retirement, that's, that's very necessary. It's very proper for people when, when they get older, right? No question about it. Now, let's say government says, we're the ones who are going to be in charge to make sure that those people have those things, okay? We decide for the people that it's going to be good for them, and we're going to run a program that provides retirement for them and provides insurance for them. Now, that's a, a different question, isn't it? Yeah, it may be good, but what's the issue? Not whether it's good, but whether it's right. The retirement program that, that the government set up is called Social Security, and the insurance program is called Medicare. Okay. Now, the only way for people to get retirement program or to get um, insurance, if they don't have it, is to take it from someone else. I mean. Money doesn't grow on trees, right? You have to take it from one to give to another. And that's where we start to get into the realm of right. Is it right for government to say, it's so good that these people have retirement insurance, we're going to take it from those who have and give it to them. That's not right. That's called stealing, right? Stealing is not good whether it's the government or people. So the challenge of this is they've taken something that's good, but it's not right. And so they've provided that. How does the government justify doing this? Well, 
obviously we can look to the Constitution. Okay, let's look to this for a second here. They look in, in Article 1, uh, Section 8, that's the powers of Congress. They look to the general welfare powers and they say, gosh, I don't see them there. Okay, well, they aren't there. Let, let's check the, the common defense powers. Maybe they'll be there. No, they're not there either. Ooh, I know. Let's go to the necessary and proper clause. We already said it's, it's necessary that people have retirement money. There we go. Necessary. That's how we can provide Social Security. And it's proper they have medical care, right? So there's interest. Medicare. Medicare can be tied into proper. That's how we can find it. Necessary, Social Security. Proper, Medicare. Excellent. Now we're good, right? Now that sounds good. The problem is those words aren't written in there, are they? And it's not just necessary and proper. We've already learned it's necessary and proper for what? For carrying to execution the foregoing powers. And the, those foregoing powers are not listed there. The power to provide insurance, to provide retirement people, that simply isn't there. Who should provide insurance in retirement? The people themselves, right? You don't just have government do it, because what that really equates to is government taking from someone else and giving to you, and that's not right. That's wrong. So the only way the government can justify this is by erasing the last seven words of the necessary and proper clause, right? Because it's necessary, it's proper. We're good. Okay. You may say, hey, Jeff, you're getting a little wound up about this. Don't worry about things like this. Well, let me just show you an example why this actually matters. Give you a little bit of an application, okay? Here's a picture. This is a $100 bill, a nice crisp $100 bill. That's a stack of $100, $100 bills, and that's $10,000, all right? Stack a bunch of those together, and you have $1 million. That's probably more money than most of us will make in our lifetime. $1 million, okay? It's a huge stack of, of $100 bills. Now, you see there at the bottom, that's our uh, stack of million. You stack those up all together and you get 100 million, about a pallet full of $100 bills. Pretty good size, right? That's a lot more money than any of us are gonna make in our lifetime, $100 million. But let's take 10 of those pallets and, and put them together. That's a billion dollars, all right? Okay, and as, as you guessed, we're gonna go bigger here. You take those pallets, and you may not be able to tell, but we, let's double stack them and let's make them as long and as wide as a football field or a soccer field. Double stacked pallets full of $100 bills as wide and as tall and as long as a football field is what $1 trillion looks like. Okay? Now stick with me. Maybe you're wondering, where are we getting at, Jeff? What's your point here? Well, let's stack those 18 times, okay? $18 trillion. That's what $18 trillion looks like. And what is $18 trillion? Does that ring a bell to you? $18 trillion is our current national debt. That's a big deal. That's a lot of money. Because debt, good or bad? Yeah, bad. <laughs> That's a bad thing, okay? Now, take that stack. I don't know if you can see it here in this picture, but it's, it's the stack that's right there next to the Statue of Liberty, right? There's, there's your stack of 18 trillion. Right next to it, though, is a big, huge, double size skyscraper of $114.5 trillion. $114.5 trillion. Now, what is, that's astronomical. You can't even imagine what that is, okay? But $114.5 trillion. That $114.5 trillion is what's called unfunded liabilities. Unfunded means there's not money. You know, liability, liability is a bad thing. Okay? It's something you owe. $114.5 uh, trillion dollars that we owe, and, we, and America has no idea how we're going to pay for it. Do you know what 95% of that big stack of huge amounts of money is? You guessed it, Medicare and Social Security. Two things the government got involved in because they're good. People need retirement. People need insurance. They need health care. Yeah, they do, but they should provide it because when the government provides it, we go $114.5 trillion upside down in debt. So that's why it matters, okay? So we can talk about it and say, oh, well, Jeff, don't, don't whine about this. Don't worry about it. Well, I actually am kind of worried about it. I hope you are too. $114.5 trillion is a lot of money, all because the government did something that was good but wasn't right. Congress shall have power to make all laws, you reading with me, which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Again, the Congress shall have power to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper for carrying to execution the foregoing powers, right? Next, the Congress shall have power to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Good. A couple more here. The Congress shall have power to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. The Congress shall have power to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper pertaining into execution the foregoing powers. Second to last one, the Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. You're still with me, right? The last one, all the blanks. The Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper 
you're carrying into execution the foregoing paths.